I once gave a talk where I once opened a, a, gui a, guide, a footpath, a guided walk with a footpath, and um, as I was speaking, an otter appeared uh, mid-sentence, and all everyone was going, ooh, ah, I thought it was my talk, you know, that everyone was getting very excited about. But no, it was an otter, completely upstaged me, ended up on the front page of the local newspaper. But never have I been surrounded by all the birds that I've written about in this book. So it's quite apposite, and you can hopefully afterwards, when I've finished, um, go down and check out some of the birds I'm talking about. But, um, yeah, if Will could position himself so he could move, we have a high technology here tonight. We're going to have sound, but also I've got some visual images. I don't normally talk to slides in a sort of PowerPoint-type fashion. I normally either just talk or I have a scrolling sequence of images, and I often forget when I'm doing PowerPoints to move to the next picture, but I've got Will here to prompt me that I need to change the pick. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, um, uh, essentially, w the first thing I want to answer is, w you know, why are birds so important culturally to human beings? Um, and then I'm going to illustrate that with just really three groups of birds, but they're quite complex stories and they involve the art of Picasso and Van Gogh and the writings of people like Blake and contemporary poets and George Meredith and we've got the most popular piece of classical music in the British canon. So we've got a lot to pack in, um, but having said all that, it is a hot evening. If you feel yourselves, you're all drinking pims. I seem to have seen somebody sneaking in gin and tonics, etc. So you're all bound to fall asleep. If you feel that happening, then put your hand up and ask me a question. I don't mind being interrupted during the course of the talk. So, you know, it's an intimate space, and, and, I, and I'm very happy if, you, if you, f you have a question, but hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, having said all that as a prelude, I normally build up in my talk to the key moral of the point of the whole evening. But on this occasion, because it is so hot, I'll give you the key moral now. <laughs> and then you can have a drink and fall asleep and you'll still get the, the key gist of it. But the whole of my work has been about uh, exploring the extent to which birds are important um, for our imaginative lives or how the environment, how the natural world, how nature, how the other parts of life, since we are nature ourselves, are absolutely essential to our creative process. And um, we worked on this book for five years, myself and David Tipling, and I've got some of David's pictures. A, a number of them are mine, and you'll spot David's pictures. He's one of the world's greatest wildlife photographers. This is a classic example. And we collaborated. It took me five years to write it. It's the largest thing I'll ever write. Well, that's what my wife, Mary, will tell you. She sat at the back. Uh, we also invited people to contribute to it, so it includes the words of over 650 people from 81 countries. And we wanted to trawl for what birds meant to people, not necessarily about their biology, but how they worked in people's lives, how they shaped their sense of, of, of themselves, of life itself, and that really is truthfully what the talk is about. So, we have found a language to talk about the significance of nature, and it's, you know, bound up in in the realms of science and its biodiversity and ecosystems or ecosystem services or, you know, all these, this language, this, con this constructed narrative we have about nature has been dominated by science. And that's good and that's how it should be. Science is the key source of myths. But we, it underrates or underassesses the role of nature in shaping creativity. And I think that our imaginations are not a kind of free-floating, autonomous thing. They are a perpetual dialogue between our Paleolithic sense experience and the rest of life. That we are constantly asking questions of our environment. Of course, the main environment we're interested in is ourselves. So most of our literature and writing is about people. But, but it's also used as other parts of nature to get at certain ideas. And I think birds are particularly important. Um, but the larger key point is that as we shrink biodiversity, as we shrink the biological, the rest of nature, we are suffering an imaginative deficit. We are losing the things by which we construct our imaginative worlds. And, 
and therefore we are under assessing how important nature is to us. Everything about us comes from nature. This talk tonight wouldn't happen without 400 million year old ferns that are providing the electricity that power the PowerPoint itself. So, so, so nature is the source of everything we are, but it's also the source of our creative process. It was uh, sort of ideas that Emerson, great American transcendentalist wrote. But why are birds particularly important? And I'll have the next picture, Will. I wonder if you should get a seat and sit there and then you can just, are you sure? Okay. Right, okay, well, why are birds important? Well, they are warm-blooded like ourselves. That's the other key thing. And they are diurnal, unlike most mammals. Um, um, they walk on the earth on two legs, which very other few organisms do. And then they do something no human has ever done. They open their wings and they fly away. So birds are like us. Uh, and then when they fly, they are totally unlike us. And I think that the bird in flight is also a very powerful set of constituents. There is, of course, the bird itself, but there's also the uh, anonymous space in which, through which they move. The air itself is important, and air is, is w when, it, when connected or when linked with birds, provides us with a way of talking about certain things. One of those is life itself uh, and time. You know, we all know, we are, we are all driven by uh, a sense of time, but how do you express what time is? And I think a bird flying through space is a fantastic way of, us, of embodying the notion of, um, of, of time. But it's not just that, they also... Um, express ideas that are transcendent, so the way in which we, are trans, we, are, we uh, uh, transcend the physical body, as it were, it, it, and, and become the spirit. So very often birds were seen as the, the spirit leaving the body, and that is a recurrent part of mythologies throughout the world. And there's a fantastic quote from the Venerable Bede, who wrote a history of England, I think it was in the 6th century AD, uh, and I have up the sparrow, probably the humblest of birds, and he, he wrote this, and it embodies many of the ideas about why birds are important. The present life of man upon earth seems to me in comparison with that time which is unknown to us, like the swift flight of a sparrow through Mead Hall, where you sit at supper in winter with your eldermen and thanes while the fire blazes in the midst and the hall is warmed, but the wintry storms of rain or snow are raging abroad, the sparrow flying in at one door and immediately out at another, whilst he is within is safe from the wintry tempest. But after a short space of fair weather, he immediately vanishes out of your sight, passing from winter to winter again. So this life of man appears for a little while, but of what is to follow or what went before, we know nothing at all. So there's that combination of the bird as a metaphor for us and, and, and of the air or the winter, the kind of anonymous, amorphous winter space outside the hall, standing for something that is mysterious and ineffable and, and almost inexpressible. So birds have often been metaphors for love, for, um, uh, for mortality, you know, the idea recurrent throughout the entire languages of all human beings. So these ideas are recurrent and I think birds are, are important, you know, there are other furry creatures which fly, bumblebees for example, but they don't lend themselves to this kind of identification of ourselves with the other creature. And I think it's bipedalism is critically important and the fact that they walk on two legs on the earth. There's a cassowary, I've never had that as a prop before in one of my talks. <laughs> but look at how, I mean obviously it's not human-like, but let me tell you, I have, I've been in a garden with a cassowary and they are extraordinary. I mean, they are sort of human-sized um, and, and much more like a human than, than the creature to the left of it. <laughs> um, so the other thing, I think, finally to say is that birds have been metaphors for other parts, for inner parts of human life. The creative process itself, how do we articulate the free movement of our imaginations or ourselves 
through the realms of our memories and sense experience, this kind of indeterminate body of stuff which is ours as individuals, and then our self, if you like, the I that roams through it. Birds seem to be metaphors for that as well. So very often, if you look at uh, the most important bird in all culture, which is the nightingale, and I'm not going to speak about that tonight, that is precisely one of the ideas that is used it, it, uh, relentlessly in Persian and Arabic poetry, and latterly by Europeans who borrowed many of the ideas from the Arabs. But I want to talk about the other critically important bird, if I could have the next picture, Will. Um, Oh yeah, there was another, sorry, there was a me forgetting. These are cranes. I mean, one of the classic ideas is that language itself, writing, the Greeks thought the, Gr the, the cranes wrote words on the sky and gave us the letters, the alphabet, which we use to, to articulate our ideas. And, th and those are precisely ideas that Kathleen Jamie, a contemporary poet, uses uh, today. So they, they, they haven't lost resonance. I think there's one other thing to say about why birds are so important to us, and that is, of course, that they speak, or they sing and seem to speak. And, and that is, you know, if you add them all up, you have a cluster of reasons why birds are so important. And I, I want to talk about the second most important songbird in the UK, if I could have the next picture, Will. I mean, Aldous Huxley said, if we took birds out of the English poetry, you'd have to get rid of most of the canon. You know, birds are omnipresent in poetry, and the, the, much of it about the fact that they sing to us. And so, therefore, birds have this unique set of characteristics which mirror and shed light on parts of our experience. And, of course, a bird, as a metaphor, can stand simultaneously for all of those ideas at once. It doesn't necessarily have to be pinned down to a single set of, uh, uh, of intellectual coordinates. It is all those things simultaneously. And I, I can take you a little bit that, through that with talking about um, the poetry of the Skylark. And what's interesting is that um, our imaginations work by appropriating birds by taking possession of them and converting them into things that we found useful in a very arbitrary way. And th 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 this was classically so with the two most important birds of all, which are the nightingale and the skylark. Blackbird and swift are starting to overtake it now in modern poetry and modern writing. But those two birds, the vast volumes of poetry about these two birds is extraordinary. And that's because dramatic pause, because they are disembodied sounds. They seem to come from out of some other element. If you've ever heard nightingales, the song pours forth out of the darkness. And in the case of the skylark, it pours forth out of the very sky itself. It seems to be a dematerialized song. Very often you can't see the skylark. How often do you hear it and say, how wonderful I can hear a skylark, but you don't ever bother to look for it. And if anybody has ever been looking for nightingales, seeing it, truthfully, is a really insignificant part of the process. It is just to listen to it. And I think the fact that it was a disembodied performance, or is a disembodied performance, means that um, those particular songs lent themselves to our appropriation. And what I want to take you through briefly with the Skylark is the extent to which um, I, I see nature writing as essentially love filtered through observation and knowledge. Love filtered through observation and knowledge. And early poetry is just love. There is very little filtering of it. There is some observation, and I'll read you a classic example. Um, this is, this is Blake um, in a poem called Milton on the Skylark, and um, it, it's a nice poem. The lark sitting upon his earthy bed, just as the morn appears, listens silent. Then, springing from the waving cornfield, loud he leads the choir of day, trill, 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 trill. 
mounting upon thy wings of light into the great expanse, re-echoing against the lovely blue and shining heavenly shell. His little throat labours with inspiration. Every feather on throat and breast and wings vibrates with the effluence divine. All nature listens silent to him and the awful sun stands silent upon the mountain, looking on this little bird with eyes of soft humility and wonder, love and awe. Now, it's a, it's a slightly unusual Blake poem and not full of sort of Blakean sentiments, but for the romantic poets, skylarks were seen as kind of heavenly orisons. They were prayers from above because the bird was above. You know, it seemed that it was a kind of religious experience. But there's very little, you know, the sun in awe and the trembling feathers. You know, Blake never saw the trembling feathers on the, on the throat of a skylark because you can't actually see them. They're about 300 metres up. So, so, so you can see that the symbol has just become a kind of arbitrary appropriation of it to express the ideas that the poet wants. He kind of coerces it to, uh, to, to perform the purpose that he has for it. Now, I want to play you a bit of um, classical music and read you another poem, which I think is rooted in a very profound set of ecological ideas about skylarks. And it's a George Meredith poem. It's the inspiration for the piece of music and both are called The Lark Ascending. The fant fantastic thing about the Meredith poem is he tries to mimic, how can you mimic birdsong with words, but that's what he tries to do. It's a wonderful poem just to look at on the page and I recommend you do that. He rises and begins, this is the start of it. He rises and begins to round, he drops the silver chain of sound, of many links without a break. I mean, that itself is a fantastic set of metaphors for Skylark Song of many links without a break, in chirrup, whistle, slur and shake, all intervolved and spreading wide like water dimples down a tide, where ripple, ripple over curls and eddy into eddy whirls, for singing till his heaven fills, tis love of earth that he instills, and ever winging up and up, our valley is his golden cup, and he the wine which overflows, to lift us with him as he goes, the wood and brooks, the sheep and kine. He is the hills. This is another part of the poem. He is the hills, the human line, the meadows green, the fallows brown, the dreams of labour in the town. He sings the sap, the quickened veins, the wedding song of sun and rains. He is the dance of children, thanks of sowers, shout of primrose banks, and eyes of violets while they breathe. All these the circling song will wreathe, and you shall hear the herb and tree, the better heart of men shall see, shall feel celestially as long as you crave nothing save the song. Isn't that fantastic? Um, and I think what's important is that what both Vaughan Williams and Meredith drew upon was something fundamental to the ecology of skylarks and to of humankind, and particularly to the English. This is the most popular piece of classical music uh, as judged by Desert Island Discs. And who, who, is, who is there who dare question Kirsty? Is it Kirsty Walk or Kirsty? Anyway, Kirsty somebody. Kirsty? Young. Kirsty Young, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a program about, uh, it's a program about exile. And this is the piece of music that is most often chosen to express something about the UK. And I think there is something in the, 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 the sound of a skylark because it probably wasn't heard in the UK until those Neolithic axes started pounding away on the South Downs and the parts of the wildwood which completely blanketed the UK at the end of the last ice age for the whole of the early Holocene. So what England has become, or the idea of England does this pastoral landscape where skylarks were super abundant. There's a fantastic piece of writing um, inspired from a place not far away from here by W.H. Hudson in Nature in Downland, which I wanted to read to you. But it's about hearing skylarks just going on and on and on in choral form across the entire Downland landscape, scores of birds. And of course, the, that was true at one time. It was certainly true when Vaughan Williams 
wrote the music, and it was certainly true when Meredith wrote the song. And I think what, what the idea that Meredith expresses, he is the hills, the human line, the skylark is us. And at some level, the ecology which created the food which gave life to the English also gave life to the skylark. You can't have one without the other. They are codependents upon a treeless environment. As a great naturalist called Max Nicholson said, not only do you not find skylarks in, in trees, you don't even find them near trees. So you needed an open, arable landscape for skylarks to flourish. And I think it's a fantastic, how he discerned that ecological linkage between the people of the, of the, the English and that bird, but it seemed to express something profoundly important about us as a nation. Um, of course, now you can't go out like W.H. Hudson did and hear skylarks all over this landscape because we have rubbished our countryside with chemicals and we have depleted our skylarks. There were once estimated to be 30 million skylarks in Britain up to the 1980s. Millions and millions of skylights were caught and eaten or used as songbirds for Victorian parlours. The consumption of the surplus numbers of skylarks across Europe was absolutely astronomical. And if there were 30 million in the 1980s, you can bet your bottom dollar that there were many more. Hundreds of thousands of them were, were caught at Dunstable or on the Bedfordshire Downs and brought to markets and sold in Smithfield to be eaten in lark pie, etc. And it wasn't that which is done for the Skylark. It is the, it's the breakage of the link between the English countryside and ourselves and the break between the bird and its landscape. So Skylarks have become something totally different. And here's a very modern poem by a fantastic poet who I spoke to just the other day uh, called Alistair Elliott. I've used the whole poem in a new book which is coming out in April. It's called Talking of Skylarks. It's a totally different kind of poetics. It shows the full spectrum of ways in which skylarks have been used by the English to talk about landscape and relatedness to the rest of nature. Suddenly larks are rare. A fertilizer kills the reason for their song. Their landscape fills with whispers that some sharp-eared god enjoys. Papery music, low botanical noise. Friends give each other names of fields, not drugged, where birds still practice their ascensions on transparent words, still disappear in light and silence where nobody else can hide a span of air. You think of following them. The sound of summer now falls only from an aeroplane that echoes somehow in the soft sky. I'll find an interview a lark with my machine but will that comfort you? Nature is leaving Earth. The species, one by one, withdraw their voices. Soon the creatures shall have gone, leaving the subtle horns of rock for nitrogen and oxygen and noble gas to play upon. Speaking of larks by Alistair Elliott. So you can see how I don't do slide talks with PowerPoint, so I'll move on through a few more skylarks. Sorry about that. but. Um, you had Vaughan Williams to keep you going. Could we have the next pick, actually, Will? And the next one. <laughs> I'll try and keep up. No, leave it on that. OK, so I want to talk to you about some... Why would I talk to you about corvids? I don't know. I quite like them. Um, yeah, corvids are an amazing. The rest of the talk is essentially about corvids, but what I want to show you is the multiple meanings and way in which corvids have been used by societies, including ourselves. Um, they are the most demonized birds in the British lexicon, only equaled once by owls, which have been, and that's another interesting example of how a, a, um, a set of birds can be start off with a powerful cultural resonance and meaning, and that can be, over time, changed completely on its head. And I think that possibly will take place with corvids, and I'll explain that as I go along. But what's wonderful about the magpie is that it sort of resonates its colours, its, its monochrome um, uh, pied plumage, uh, 
absolutely exemplifies the multiple meanings which we projected onto corvids. Um, they're the least protected of all the bird families across the world. In the USA, hunters can kill them in open season with no bag limits. Some historical assaults on crow roosts are quite extraordinary. In 1937, a posse of well-armed Texans using a simultaneous detonation of 180 bombs over two nights killed in the region of 70,000 corvids. A couple of years later, the same state, the state authorities in Illinois slaughtered 328,000 corvids using a festoon of dynamite bombs. The event was so broadcast, it ended up on the, on the front page of Life magazine. And much the same treatment is meted out to corvids across Europe. In the 27 countries of the EU, the five commonest corvid species are widely persecuted, and the annual bag is 3.5 million birds, and that's almost certainly an underestimate. It is millions and millions of crows that we're killing. Uh, and the least protected of all is the carrion crow. And the interesting thing is that the four corvids in Australia have had legal protection for about 50 years, which is very interesting, because Aussies are not um, lily-livered folk. But the interesting thing is that um, uh, these, were, um, these are terrible measures, but we know corvids will survive. Uh, in the Tudor times, it was worse because our legislation was genocidal. It was a, 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 a legal framework of extermination. It was... Um, uh, in 1544, a man called George Amory in Cheshire had to appear in court because he permitted uh, corvids or crows to build in his woods to the injury of the country and contrary to the statute. Another Cheshire hamlet called Hunterston was fined 10 shillings for failing to maintain the crow nets. Um, and it was not just a, a question of economic nuisance. In 1604, the how, how we wish this might happen today. The House of Commons rejected a parliamentary bill. You could imagine the, the Brexit going through and a jackdaw flew through the chamber. And uh, the key sponsor was interrupted by this, oh, Will. That's the house crow, but we'll have the next picture as well. We'll come back to the house crow. I'm slightly jumbled up. There's, there's um, jackdaws, which I photographed in Buxton quite recently. Go back to the house crow, if you will, Will. Um, so the bill was rejected because of Jackdaw, because it was so dangerous and so full of ill omen. It was such a bad omen. Um, and just to show you how arbitrary these ideas are, I'll just give you one other example. In India, the house crow is a particularly uh, abundant in exactly the ways that people... Um, felt about the corvids in America or in the UK and um, they feed them rice as symbols of their ancestors or their, their deceased relatives. It's a kind of mourning ritual which they particularly perform on their birthday and there is absolutely no ecological distinction. You know, this is, this is, a, this is a particularly ruthless beast, the house crow, but they cherish them. There is no negative association with them in, exact, in, in, in that cultural sense. Uh, one of the critical issues for, the, for Europeans is that black was the color of evil. In, 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 the, in the lexicon of color, darkness, black was was immoral, was evil, was, was bad. And so they, they, they were bound to be, in a sense, uh, have these negative associations. But I mean, they are universal in our culture. Um, in Germany, a, a, a rabbin ass, which is a rather interesting word, was a name used for an evil villain, um, while a rabenstein was the sort of place where it meant ravenstone, was a place for a gibbet where a robin ass would probably end up his, his days, you know, being hung. Um, the raven book was a euphemism for a, a, a list of the deceased. A raven bill was a form of surgical implement. Uh, in, in, in Russia, in the sort of Stalinist period, uh, uh, the cars that came to spiritual way in the night were known as crows. So we have this very long, uh, ancient 
millennial hatred of Corvids. And if we could have the next pick. Next one. This is the raven, probably the most hated of all the birds. And there's a, if you want to see the demonization of ravens, go and look at the raven down here, because the raven is perched over a beautiful little hare, and the guy who made the skin has poked out the eyes of the hare and trailed blood coming from it, which is a classic sort of idea, you know, this vicious, nasty bird. Not only does it dismember and eat the hare, but it blinds it first in this cruel way. So ravens were particularly hated and were... Um, ravens were not only seen as portents of evil, they were thought to spread contagion in Britain until I think it was about the 18th century. So when we get ravens, I haven't got you the full... I'll do the next pick. Um, I haven't got you the full picture of um, the birds, but when Hitchcock used Corvids in the film The Birds, he was trading on something that is fundamentally embedded in our imaginations, in our collective sense of the meaning of birds. He traded on something that was thousands of years old. This wasn't a modern creation, um, but what Daphne du Maurier did, and what Hitchcock did as well, was borrow a new bird, which is particularly abundant in Brighton, and is probably highly demonised. And if you want to read about it, I've got a piece in Countryfile about this very issue, but I've noticed wherever I've gone the, the long call of herring gulls. And of course they're a, they're a major issue because they nest on people's roofs. But du Maurier saw a flock of what were probably black-headed gulls, these, following a tractor and wrote her short story, The Birds. Hitchcock picked it up and ran with it. And what was interesting is they did, in a sense, tap in to something that was mid-20th century, which was that gulls were moving into towns and cities and were appropriating some of the malignity which we'd projected onto Corvids. And I think if you watch the film again, you'll see some key moments of Hitchcock's film which used the, both the very modern demonised bird, the gulls. Uh, I particularly think of the scene, which is pure Hitchcock, but beautifully symmetrical. He has Tippi Hedren trapped in a phone booth, the bird in its gilded cage, with the birds surrounding her and trapping her in the booth, and they're crashing against the glass of the, of the phone uh, box. And, uh, and, of course, the other scene which you're all remembering, um, which is kind of enshrined now in, in, in modern mythology, is the scene on the, play, the playing frame where the children are in the school. And um, they're singing that fabulous... I don't know where he got it from. I have done a bit of research into it. I don't know if you can recall it. It goes, Rissledy, Rossledy, Hey Johnny, Dossledy. Ziggity daggity diddle de diddle de. And as they're singing this kind of nonsense song, the ravens gather on the frame. It's a fantastic bit of Hitchcockian horror because you have the juxtaposition of the innocence of the song and of the children's choral voices, but also this amazing gathering of dark menace from the birds themselves. And of course, then they attack and peck out. Um, what's her name, Plachette's beautiful green eyes. So it's a fantastic moment, but don't think it's modern. Don't think of it as modern. It is a modern representation of something embedded in the psyche of Western culture. And I want to show you two other great examples. We're on target here, Will. Oh, yeah, there's Hitchcock, sorry. We're out of sync again. Go on, the next one. I want to talk a little bit about Picasso and Picasso's use of the same kinds of dark symbolism, but in an incredibly wonderful way. So I'll have the next picture. Um, yeah, Picasso did these two versions of this one painting called um, w Girl Kissing a Raven. And uh, they were done in about 1901. They're classic expressions of the blue period. And... Um, Picasso actually knew this person. She was called Margaret Luke. She was the stepdaughter of the owner of the Le Lapin uh, Agile, which was in Montmartre, a, a, a Parisian watering hole where 
uh, where, pa where Picasso used to hang out and possibly was Margaret Luke's lover. And um, he expressed his kind of modernity, his rejection of modern, uh, of, of ancient attitudes that birds would project. And, and so people would keep ravens to be chic and cool. You know, I don't really care about all this dark symbolism. I'm a bit, you know, way. And, um, and this bird used to peck amongst the cafe, would go amongst the tables and feed and and, and almost certainly Picasso saw her with this extraordinary bird. I mean, they, are, they make the most incredible pets. Of course, we know now that they are amazingly intelligent. They can vocalise. The vocalisations they use often carry meanings. They have intelligence equal to primates. They are extraordinary birds. I don't want to get into that. But what, what, what is fantastic here is Picasso's use of this bird. And it was at once a genuine piece of natural... Uh, naturalistic uh, representation of something he probably saw, but it also chimed with the mood that he was imbued with that forms his most important period called the Blue Period. And it was triggered in part by the death of his friend, if we could have the next painting. Um, I probably haven't got them in sequence. There are two versions. Yeah, go on. Um, there are two versions of it. I'll come back to the, to the second version, but... Um, you can see how useless I am at PowerPoint, but it doesn't matter. This is Carl, uh, Carl's Casagamus, and Casagamus was one of Picasso's oldest friends from his days in Barcelona. They'd moved to Paris together, and Casagamus um, was represented in this fantastic blue period painting called La Vie. Um, it's a very naturalistic, he looked very like that from the images that we have. Um, but Casagamus blew his brains out in front of his girlfriend and his friends. Uh, and this had a devastating impact on Picasso, plus the fact that he was very poor. And so, you know, the blue paintings, the paintings from the blue period, would equal most of the economies of many modern states. They are so valuable. They are seen as such an important part of his work. If we could go back to the, to the other version, Will. Um, and he did two versions of this painting. And in one, ravens have a particularly musty vibrant smell. They smell kind of wonderful. And you can almost see her breathing in raven musk in this one. Look at the length of her fingers. I mean, they are so ludic. They are almost the thickness of the legs of the raven and etiolated and bony and sallow and most of the figures that he drew. And I don't think you can overlook the fact that this is a woman embracing death. She is wan and pallid and reduced to almost skeletal frame and caressing this bird in this way is an is a absolutely perfect metaphor for Picasso to capture the ideas of the blue period, of, of life at its most miserable, at life full of poverty and sadness and darkness. And I think it shows how symbols are appropriated by artists, passed on from generation to generation, given fresh nuance and meaning, but essentially using very ancient ideas. I mean, I, I, I find them intoxicating images. One is in, in Toledo, and the other one is in private hands, I think, in Chicago. I think this one, in some ways, is the, is the more powerful. Her, her, her mouth is slightly open, and the nose is rested over the bird. Um, but let's move on to, um, to another, um, the most famous Corvid painting in the whole world. Um, this is uh, Van Gogh. Uh, it's called um, Wheatfield with Crows, Champ de Blé au Corbeau. And it's an incredibly important painting, not only because it absolutely exemplifies all of Van Gogh's characteristic, the sort of thick impasto paint, you know, you know almost kind of crushed into the canvas. Um, but it was also very important because he painted it just before he shot himself. And um, uh, he was 37. It was the 29th of July, 1890. And... The painting was assumed to be his last work, and therefore it was a kind of suicide note in colour. And there were a number of characteristics which cemented these ideas. The disappearing path, vanishing over the horizon. 
the, the dark brooding sky and, and then to add the kind of guild, the sense of its meaning. This flock, this indeterminate flock of birds either flying away from the artist or, fl or possibly even worse, flying towards him to peck out his lovely blue eyes. You know, so this was seen as a suicide note. I think what's fascinating for me about it is that that is the meaning that crows have had for thousands of years. And therefore, that idea of it being a suicide note was absolutely embedded in the identity of the birds. The problem with that is they aren't crows, they're rooks. And I'll take you through that. Um, it was done in 1890. Um, Rooks are, um, as you all know, uh, if you've read Crow Country, and I sincerely hope you have, um, are, 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 are gregarious birds, and particularly so in late summer um, at this time of year, because they're all feeding their young. Carrion crows are solitary birds, territorial holding solitary birds that retain territories dominated by the breeding pair. And at this time of year, they have little collectives involving the pair with their offspring. Very occasionally, nowadays, you do get slightly larger congregations. The problem is that this was France in Paris in 1890, and corvids were ruthlessly suppressed, um, particularly because people hunted. Um, and therefore, um, it is totally... It, well, I would say it's virtually impossible, but let's say it's just highly unlikely that they're carrying crows. In fact, I wrote to a Parisian ornithologist and he said at that time it would be impossible for it to be a collective. Carrying crows do form flocks, but it's in winter and they often don't congregate until after dark. And I've often gone to look for corvid roosts and many of them don't arrive until it is actually pitch dark. So they're very, and then they leave before it's light. So carrying crows are very rare to see, but this is a typical scene for rooks. And this is important for me because rooks have none of the darkness that carrion crows have. I mean, I've searched the literature, and although large congregations, if I could have the next picture, because I think it's a picture of Van Gogh, let's just remind ourselves of his wonderful face and his eyes pecked out by those terrible birds. And the next picture. Yeah, so these are rooks, and, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is at the time of the French Revolution, the, the revolutionaries would kill rooks because they were symbols of the hated stately homes of the aristocracy. Because the aristocracy of France, like the aristocracy of, and the landowning classes of the UK, loved rooks. And if you look at the history of rook, uh, metaphorical language, they're, they're birds of constable. They're associated with rural normality. They're rustic extras. They rest their harrows over their shoulders after mowing the hay. They're lovely kind of collective creatures. Every village had a rookery. And as I say, in France, at the time of the revolution, I don't know if it's true, but it was said that they, they exterminated rookeries because the rook was um, associated and identified with the hated landed classes. And so therefore, it's a completely different set of metaphorical associations. And if you call it wheat field with rooks, all its darkness goes away. Um, and in fact, it wasn't Van Gogh's last painting. It was, um, and, and you know, if we can recall it, I don't want to go back, but um, if we can, well, you can go back, yeah. You know, it's, it's not, I mean, of course, the, the symbolism that it has, that has been projected onto it, may be contained in the idea of the path, but it also incredibly vibrant and beautiful, and, 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 and there's nothing in Van Gogh's diaries or writings about rules would suggest he had any negative associations with them. He saw them in England, etc. So you can re-see this painting as drained of its darkness, of something that's actually very beautiful, regardless of the fact that he did kill himself shortly afterwards. But the intensity of the yellow 
the congregated nature of the birds. Maybe, you know, it's, 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 it's for each person to interpret. What I think is fascinating about this is everything I have said, everything about this painting, all the symbolic associations are based on 40 children's M-shaped birds <laughs> flying across the painting. And then also, in the context of what I've told you, the difference between the word crow and rook. And that meaning, the, the, the contained meaning in those two names, all the associations that flow out from those two monosyllables, is to me absolutely extraordinary. And it just shows you the way in which birds provide us with a language to talk about our experience, ourselves, about all kinds of different things. They aren't just, uh, they don't just live out there, they live here. In our, their, one of their key habitats is between our ears. And I want to talk finally about a cluster of associations with Corvids, which I find one of the most um, moving and affecting um, that I know. <clears throat> it's a totally different story. It's to show you how arbitrary are the projections which we, uh, which we, which we place upon birds. If we could have the next picture. That's a big flop. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not very good at this stuff. But there we are. Here we are. Okay, so I want to take you to the Pacific Northwest which is a 15 degree arc from the panhandle of Alaska right down to the borders of the USA at the Washington River in, oh, go on, the Columbia River in Washington, sorry. So it's a long 1,500 mile journey down the west coast. And this was occupied from about 15,000 BC by a whole cluster of different communities, primarily by um, by five different language communities. And although they had basic linguistic uh, associations and shared a modest number of words or word sounds, these five communities of the Pacific Northwest of the USA, of North America, spoke languages that are as different from one another in structure and vocabulary as Arabic, English, Japanese, Persian, and Finnish. But they shared an artistic language and expressed through animals. I'm only going to give you the names, I'm, like, I'm only giving you my version of the names of these people, but they're called the Tlingit, the Haida, and the Simshian of just three of the tribes that I single out just to give you an example of the difficulty of saying even their names, the Tlingit. And they all shared uh, elements of social structure and artistic heritage. And another common element in their lives was the material affluence of their um, experience and their, their, their communities. They were based on a marine ecosystem. They had massive abundances of timber and game and fish and seafood, spawning salmon in particular. I mean, they were incredibly well fed. They had large amounts of time to devote to creativity, and they also ate seals and cetaceans and otters. And, and their villages were made from this extraordinary cedar planking. When, we, when they were first encountered by the West, their houses and, were grand affairs with elaborately carved structures, and gave to the world one of the totems that I've always associated with all the Native Americans of the whole of, 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 of the Americas, and that was the totem pole, you know, you see, images of the Apache all of them going round the totem pole. Um, and I just thought every Native American village had a totem pole, but no, they were primarily creations of the Pacific Northwest. And if we have the next pic, Will. Um, this is the area that they occurred in. Um, here's the panhandle up here, all the way through, um, along the coast through Canada and down to almost to Seattle and Vancouver here. So a massive area of, of North America. Um, very complex cultures with um, a, 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 a rich symbolic language, at the heart of which was the mythic figure of the raven. You have the next bit. So there, there's a totem pole. Their art is permeated with um, images of animals, not just ravens, 
but um, of eagles and woodpeckers, um, of bears, if I have the next pick. Um, it's just a close up, sorry. Um, here's a raven on an extraordinary Simshian, uh, uh, um, what is it, a, a sort of canoe um, that I saw in the American Museum of Natural History with a, with a, a classic. Try and just recall the structure of the raven. The bird is in flight. Here's its head, here's its beak, there's its body. And look at the interlocking patterns that are used to recreate the form of the raven. And if you look at their art, this ovoid form recurs constantly. So animals and, and representations are produced in this, in, in this rather amorphous, rounded set of patterns. If we have the next pick. That's the same canoe from a different angle. That's absolutely spectacular. One of the largest exhibits in the American Museum of Natural History. This is one of the largest exhibits in the British Museum. This is a raven's head uh, from the Klingit, I think it was. Oh, the hind, it was a hinder totem pole. This guy is, is over five feet long. Um, it's a spectacular piece in the British Museum. I, I strongly recommend you go and have a look at it. And one of the interesting things, let's rest on this image of a, of a pot bat, and I'll come on to that. In the story cycles of people like the Klingit and the Hyder, um, there are, we can recognize some of the characteristics that we associate with corvids, which is their astonishing adaptability. I have a copy, like probably some of you, of all nine volumes of an amazingly dull book called The Birds of the Western Paleontic which runs to about four and a half thousand pages. Fantastic book, I love it, but very dull. And in the four and a half thousand pages, the best sentence is in The Raven, where Max Nicholson said, concept of habitat almost meaningless. Because this is a bird which lives everywhere, from 18,000 feet to 2,000 meters below sea level in every kind of biome and every kind of habitat. They are amazingly adaptable. Corvids, of course, worldwide show this predisposition to adapt and change. And the Haida um, make of the raven a kind of mythic, mischievous trickster god is a kind of cheating, naughty, shameful and ridiculous creature, but also very humorous. And, but there was also a serious and magical side to the raven, and the raven was possessed of supernatural powers, and the raven was seen as, was, was, was uh, seen as a bringer of, 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 of gifts to humankind. In fact, humanity was found by the raven inside a clamshell, and he released man from the shell, and, uh, and then created woman. And in the case of the hider, he threw some pebbles into the sea and created their home, which is the Queen Charlotte Islands. So Raven was an amazingly creative spirit, transforming life and bringing existence to whole landscapes and landscape features. And that is interesting because Ravens truthfully, or Corvids, truthfully do create landscapes. As climate change impacts upon our world, Corvids are presently a single nutcracker can, can bury 100,000 seeds of trees in a single season. So an average jay, which you'll see in your parks down the road, is planting 5,000 acorns every autumn. Jays across the entire northern hemisphere spread millions and millions of birds in a great circle around the earth, are planting billions billions of tree seeds and so birds truthfully do create environments um, the raven isn't a cat isn't a cashier in the same way it doesn't bury trees but it does cash food but the, the raven was seen as a creative spirit so it is meaningful in some ways to talk of the ecological impact of corvids like that you know we think it's nonsensical we think our ideas the idea that the raven's evil pecks out the eyes of van gogh and you know blah 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 we all think that's great but the ideas of other people, we, we tended, not now, but we tended to kind of reject them. There's a fantastic set of stories by the Klingit and the Simchian about the raven. And this cycle of stories 
illustrates the commonality of the peoples of the Northern Hemisphere, because the same stories existed in, in Asia, and so were spread from Asia to America. Sometimes, to tell these stories, a bit like my talk, to tell these stories could take days, because you realize this is going on all night, don't you? Uh, anyway, the great story that they told was of the raven, how the raven gave the Milky Way, the moon, and the sun to humanity. And um, he knew of an old man who kept the Milky Way, the moon, and the sun in a series of bags in his house. And he made himself really small and dropped into the water. And the girl, his daughter, the man's daughter, drank the raven and brought her with child, a kind of raven child. And the raven child was much loved by the grandfather and he let the child do what he liked in the house. And he opened a leather bag and all the stars of the sky flew up into the heaven. And because he loved the boy, he let him get away with it. And then the boy opened another bag and inside was the moon. And the moon escaped into the sky and the moon was given to the rest of humanity. And then he opened the third bag. And as he opened the third bag, the boy that had been produced by a raven turned back into a bird and flew up the chimney. And as he went, the sun scorched his plumage so that he would be forever black. But he also gave the sun to the rest of life. And um, versions of this story are absolutely legion. If we could have the next picture. Um, uh, and there you see the raven taking the sun this is a kind of spirit human on the back, but there's the sun, probably represented by that red blob as well. So life is being brought by the raven. Um, and um, this story aligned itself with a particular part of uh, the, 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 the culture of these people of, of Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, there's a fantastic, I'll just read it, it encapsulated the entire moral basis of generosity and exchange in northwest coastal society. Raven presents the first gift, he gives himself as a child the greatest of all treasures. His grandfather reciprocates by giving Raven those treasures he had previously kept, only for himself, of which now benefit everyone. Raven gives himself as a sacrifice for the world, sacrificing his beauty for the benefit of the rest. Raven's black feathers remind us that we are part of a covenant, that we must give, must sacrifice, nothing, not wealth, not beauty, not power, not status, not life itself can be kept. And these fundamental ideas reach their um, highest expression in, um, in what was called um, the potlatch. And the potlatch was this amazing accumulation of wealth when the leaders would and give away their wealth, because what they believed was that life was constantly changing, that what was mine becomes yours. And so therefore they had these ceremonies of giving, which aligned them with the way of the world, that it was a process of, of a relentless change. And that, um, and in exactly the way that those ovoid shapes where one creature morphs into another down the totem pole, how things blur and become something else, was an essential part of the culture of this area. And when it's notable that when the, the uh, Anglo-Americans took over, they banned, they forbade the potlatch, a very Christian thing to do, which was to stop this process of giving. But what it drew from was the idea that life was in perpetual flux. And the raven was aligned to the idea of essential adaption, of movement, of change, of changing from one thing into another, but also adapting to different ways of life. And I think it's a, a, a fascinating way in which a bird can carry all those different meanings. It can be a creature of death. Remember the Picassian image of the girl breathing in death through the raven's flesh but also something that says something central, something in, in, intensely Christian in a way, that, that life is more than material things, and those material things 
that are mine can become someone else's. And the raven is the classic Christ-like metaphor for that. And I think that illuminates, you know, I try to illuminate how meanings attached to birds can be amazingly complex, but they lead us back to fundamental ideas about ourselves and about life in general. That's my talk finished. Just to flagrantly advertise my book, which I have brought for your benefit. And there was a time when I would shuffle my feet and say, you know, I have some books for sale. But I have this book at a massive discount. So if anybody would like a copy, it's reduced from £40 to £15. Thank you very much.